Great. Good morning again for everyone who has joined us since. Um, I just invite you to stand if you'd like, sit if you'd like, um, but we're just going to worship God um, together. Bye. 
Bless my mind to Calvary, where Jesus prayed and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, Savior.
Pentecostal church it's called a word in, in tongues and it's edifying to the the body if if there's someone who has an interpretation who understands what was said is there anyone here who, who thinks they know what God is speaking to us right now What a response to to so sweet to trust in Jesus. Through the to hear that he is happy to be on the other side of that relationship. Be encouraged this morning by that word. Would you just join me in a quick a quick prayer? Jesus, I thank you that we can trust in you. Father, I thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to remind us and to encourage us that you are here in our midst. And there's few moments that are special and precious where we just know, we can just feel that you're here. But in those times when you seem distant, we know, we know that the gospel is the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that you are here in our midst, whether or not we can feel you. 
whether or not it feels like you're on the other end of our prayers, whether or not it looks like you're, you're involved in the difficulties and the struggles that we're facing, Jesus, we know, we know that happiness is in you and that you are there. And so I pray, Father, as we transition to, to worshiping you by reading your word, that you challenge us, that you encourage us, that you inspire us to look more and more like your son every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You can, you can grab a seat. Thank you so much, Pastor Brielle and, and team for leading us in worship. Uh, kids, you are dismissed right now. You can follow uh, Miss Melanie uh, downstairs to, to class or run ahead of her. That's fine too. That's all good. You guys waited long and hard for that, so good job. Man, isn't it good to see little people in the house, you know, to see kids? Yeah. I love that. Love that. Hey, so uh, we're in a, a series called Summer on the Mount. We took a break last week because we have uh, some mission partners who came and shared with us. If you were watching online, we did a rerun Sunday. Uh, but it's good to be with you online and to be with all of you in person uh, this morning. If you don't know me, my name's Joe. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. Um, and I'm going to bring the word this morning. Now, I don't know uh, about you, but I get a lot of entertainment from my, my children. If you have children, uh, I hope you get entertainment out of them. If you're an uncle or an aunt, you know somebody who has children, I hope you get entertainment out of them. Because no one loves life quite like kids do, right? Um, and grandparents, we can't forget about the grandparents. Yeah, come on. Well, my kids surprised me the other day with their entrepreneurial spirit, okay? Uh, they asked me if we could go out and do a lemonade stand, and they were convinced that this was going to be a money-making business. They were ready to do this. And I remembered back as a kid doing a lemonade stand and being genuinely shocked by the lack of turnout and the lack of market for lukewarm lemonade. Um, I couldn't quite understand why, but I didn't want to dampen their spirits. So I was like, sure thing, let's go do this, guys. So we, we packed up, we, I helped them make some lemonade and they made some signs and we packed some stuff into our wagon and we were, we were pulling the wagon out of our complex to set up by the side of the road. And I could just see like dollar bills in their eyes. They were, they were ready to make money. And we get out there and we, put, we set up the table and the, the signs aren't even out yet. And Loveland pauses and she gets this very concerned look on her face. She looks down the street this way and down the street this way. She says, where is everybody? <laughs> like, did they not know that she had a lemonade stand? Where were all these people? I mean, it didn't matter that we, we didn't advertise it, that the sign wasn't even up yet, that, that nobody knew about it. They should know that Loveland had a lemonade stand. Where was everybody? And I couldn't help but wonder, is this so often how we treat people coming to church? Where is everybody? I'm here. I don't, I don't, like, doesn't the world know that we have the gospel? Don't they know that we have the good news of, of Jesus? Like, like, where, where are the people? When they're, when they're ready, I'm just going to be here with my lemonade stand. But this is a far cry from the way of Jesus, isn't it? See, Jesus had a completely different model altogether about how we were to bring good news of the kingdom of heaven to the world around us. And Jesus' model was not what is our model, which is build it and they will come, right? Jesus' model was go and tell. See, in Jesus' model, heaven is invading earth. And so often we get it reversed, we get it backwards, and we think that earth is invading heaven. And that, that, that this, is, this building is the last great uh, protection from all of the, the isms of this world, from, from secularism and, and, and postmodernism and liberalism and whatever your ism is, right? And so we, we think that, that, you know, we know that we're called to be in the world but not of the world. And so often as, as legalistic uh, people, we, we think that maybe the best way to do that is just to build walls, both phys physical and metaphorical, Instead of just being the people, being the kind of people that Jesus came to make us. Uh, last time in our, our series, Summer on the Mount, a couple weeks ago, we talked about how Jesus turns our understanding of what upside 
down and upside right. The things that we thought were upside down were actually right side up. The things that we thought were right side up, Jesus says, no, 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 that's actually upside down. You've got it all backwards. We think this world works, but Jesus says, no, no, it was designed to work this way. This is what life in the kingdom of heaven looks like. And the kingdom of heaven is something that is present right now, not something that's distant in the future, something that's out of reach, but right here in our midst. And so again, as I, as I did the first week, I want to challenge you to allow, allow the Sermon on the Mount to, to capture your imagination over and over again until it reshapes your desires and transforms your life. So we have to ask ourselves, what is Jesus' strategy for spreading the good news of the kingdom of heaven? What is Jesus' strategy for getting out there and letting people know about the hope that we have? Well, I'm glad you asked. We're going to go to Matthew 5, starting in verse 13. And while you're flipping there, I'm going to fix my mic that keeps pulling down here. This is what Jesus says. You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your Heavenly Father. We were called to spread out and stand out, not hide out and blend in. The people of the kingdom are to embody what it means to be salt and light. And while the concept is is simple, putting it into practice takes a little bit more work, doesn't it? And as a result, there's an understandable amount of confusion and disagreement about what exactly it means to be salt and light in the 21st century. And so people in in our Western culture have have kind of settled in probably about three rough camps. And these are generalizations, and you you might be identifying with one of them more than the others. The first one is, that's the pastor's job. Right? I don't, I don't know enough about the Bible. I don't know about the spiritual laws. I don't even know what the four spiritual laws are. Right? I'll leave this up for somebody who is more qualified. And, and this conclusion is, is often not a result of apathy, as we sometimes assume. Usually this is a result of just exasperation, of just not really knowing what to do. And we just think, man, I don't know what to do. And so we just, we just leave it to the experts. But the problem with this line of thinking is that leaving it to the experts is exactly the type of thing that Jesus was combating. If you remember from our our last week when we went through the, the Beatitudes, we learned that the people that the world rejects are the people that God calls, the people that he welcomes into the kingdom of heaven, the people who aren't qualified, who aren't good enough. Jesus says, no, come on in. Come on in. And then, right after saying that, he says, hey, you guys who've been rejected by religion, you guys who've been rejected by society, you are the light of the world. Not you pastors, not you teachers, not you theologians. You. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And so to say that being salt and light is someone else's job is actually a direct contradiction to what Jesus is saying. Dallas Willard reflects, these little people, without any of the character or qualifications humans insist are necessary, are the only ones who can actually make the world work. I love that. Make the world work. Because being salt and light is is so much more than just a strategy to fill the building. It's much less uh, self-centered and and selfish as just making ourselves feel good when we look out and say, man, there's a lot of people here this morning. It's a bigger picture than that. The second camp is just go ahead and get me a soapbox. Just grab me a soapbox. I'm going to stand on it and I'm going to preach. Now back in the day, uh, you may not be familiar with this, but back in the day, uh, preachers used to stand on street corners and, and, and just preach to people. 
And they would need to be taller than everyone, and so they'd get a soapbox and they would stand on it. Well, I mean, if you did that today, it was a very different culture. You have to keep in mind that, that that was kind of similar to a commercial or a TV program. You go out to the street and there are people who are selling things or, 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 or trying to tell you, about, teach you things or preach the gospel to you, standing on the corner and they're shouting at you. And that's just the way that it was done. And some people think that this is still the answer and so they use whatever platform they have to just yell at people. And, and, they, and they, they often yell at people without grace, without love, without understanding, often with expecting people to act like they're followers of Jesus, even when they've never even heard of Jesus in the first place. And, and so some people falsely assume that this is the best way to get the word out, to be salt and light. But as any parent knows, you can't guilt your child in a relationship. No matter how good of a show they put on for you, you, you cannot force an authentic relationship. Now, usually there's a reaction to this, isn't there? There's a pretty strong reaction. And, and that reaction is, you know what? Like, let's, let's not offend anyone. Let's just be nice. Let's be nice. Let's be the nice people. And then to distance themselves from, from, from people who are, who are seen as judgmental often will overreact and settle for just being nice. The only problem is that Jesus did not come to make people nice. He came to bring the kingdom of heaven, to show us what it means to be really human. And his kingdom stands in violent opposition to the kingdoms of this world. And this is to arms. What this is, is, is the picture of, of the world is, is all set up nicely on the table and Jesus comes and he goes, flip, no, it's this way. There's a violent disruption. That's not nice. It's good for you, but it's not nice. And so we can't, we can't fall into to fear and, and be passive. We can't point a finger and be judgmental. And we can't swap the kingdom for being nice. Now, chances are you, re- you relate to maybe one of these more than the other. So let's take a look at what Jesus says. What, is, what does it mean to truly be salt and light? What is our calling? Well, the first calling that we have is to preserve the earth. We are called to preserve the earth. In Jesus' day, salt was used primarily as a preservative. I don't know if you knew that there was a Maytag shortage in first century Israel. Okay? And so if you wanted your fish to last more than a couple days, you needed to cure the meat. And we've got a picture of meat curing up here for you. Now there's a process of curing meat that works by, by using salt or something, and it just like sucks all the moisture out of the meat, so that way there's less things for mold and bacteria to grow on. And so the main purpose of curing meat is to increase the shelf life, and a side byproduct of that is also its flavor. In the same way, Christians are called to preserve what is good in the world. In the words of of Leon Morris, he says, What is good in society, his followers keep wholesome. What is corrupt, they oppose. They penetrate society for good and act as a kind of moral antiseptic. See, this is a much greater and a much higher calling than fill the building. Our role as a preservative should have no strings attached. We should seek to to bring the goodness and the love and the life of the kingdom with us wherever we go. We should be invading the world in our day-to-day lives. Our motivation must be of the highest calling, and that's love. Genuine concern and care for the people around us. So let's make this intensely practical. What does this look like? What does this look like in your life? There used to be a saying, what would Jesus do? But that's far too abstract. I think the much better question is, what would Jesus do if he were me? Right? There, I don't think anyone here is a wandering Jewish rabbi in, in the first century. Right? But we've got some grandparents. We've got some moms. We've got some owners. We've got some teachers. We've got some teachers. Right? Um, so as a sales agent, how would Jesus conduct his business deals in a way that was above board and honest and looked after the little people. Right? As a small business owner, what kind of practices are off 
What kind of attitudes are, are out of place? What kind of, of things can you advocate for? There's a, there's a lawyer who, who's a Christian. He takes this salt and light, preserve the earth thing very seriously. And he does a lot of pro bono work. And, and in his spare time, he helps advocate for, for policies that align with kingdom values. There's a heating company. I was listening to the radio the other day. Praise 106.5, anyone. Um, I was listening to the radio, and there's this company, and they, they do heating for homes. And, and every quarter, it seems like, they give away and install heat pumps for people who are in need and can't afford it. They're a for-profit business, but they're being salt and light where they're at. Right? As, as a parent, would, would Jesus be absent from his children, whether uh, a world away or a screen away? Or would he teach them to pray? Right? Um, would Jesus recycle? Would he stand up for indigenous peoples? Right? I don't know if you heard or not, but, but on Penelope uh, or on, on Cooper Island, 160 kids were found this week. Right? Would, would Jesus practice ethical business practices? Would he have time to be a good neighbor? Would he love gay people? Would he feed, clothe, and house the homeless? See, as you begin to ask yourselves, what would Jesus do if he were me? We see that being salt and light is so much more than just being a good witness. It's about bringing a taste of the kingdom with you wherever it is that you go. See, it's one thing to, to be an armchair critic of society. It is another to preserve what matters. And speaking of taste, that's our second calling. We are called to flavor the earth. I like this one. Flavor the earth. I want you guys to check out this picture. Um, one more slide. There we go. So for those of you that don't know, that's Salt Bay. Okay, that's, he's an internet sensation. He's an internet, internet sensation because... He was salting some meat, and he did it like that. Like, what a time to be alive. Like, this is amazing. Like, he's world famous for this. I mean, salt brings out the natural flavor of food, right? Especially in the process of curing meat, as we talked about earlier. And in the same way, the people of the kingdom reveal the natural beauty of life. Isn't that good? In other words, you don't have to be a boring stick in the mud to be a follower of Jesus. Instead, through our actions and attitudes, we can show people a better way to be human. And this is, of course, by allowing Jesus to transform not just our actions, but the very kind of person that we are. Jesus says that if salt loses its flavor, it's worthless. Now, that's kind of a weird thing for us to understand because sodium chloride doesn't you know, lose its flavor. You can have salt on the shelf, for, shelf forever and it's still going to be salty. But not in Jesus' day. In Jesus' day, salt was very impure. And it was possible for the sodium chloride to kind of be leached out of the minerals and the minerals that remained were not salty. And at which point you couldn't stuff more salt inside of them. You just had to throw it out and get new salt. And I believe the point that Jesus is making is this. Salt that is diluted serves no purpose. In the same way, Christians whose lives are indiscernibly different from the culture do not flavor or preserve the earth. See, if we adopt the values and the morals of the earth, the sexual ethic of our culture, corrupt business practices of of people maybe around us in our, our social circles, if we accept the societal norms without fleshing them through the lens of the gospel, then we're not truly living in Jesus' right-side-up kingdom. When salt loses its saltiness, it's worthless. Here's another interesting thing about salt. Have you ever um, eaten a cookie or something, and you've taken a bite, and there was just a big clump of salt in there? Has that ever happened to anyone or just me? It is a surprise. And if you're at home, you will probably spit it out right away. If you're a guest at someone's house, you'll probably quickly grab a napkin and do one of these real quick. Um, Because it's just, it's so bitter and it's so gross. Salt only works. It only does its job if it spreads out. And I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. 
We are the salt of the earth, not the salt of the church. We are the salt of the earth, not the salt of the church. When a church loses its drive to permeate the culture, we should not be surprised when it becomes bitter and repulsive to anyone who comes near it. See, we were called to spread out and stand out, not hide out and blend in. See, the goal is is not to fill the building, but to be the kind of people that Jesus has called us to be 24-7, 365. And when we do that, this building will fill itself. Thirdly, we are called to reflect the sun. Jesus concludes by saying that we're the light of the world. He calls us the light of the world. And the natural premise of this statement is that despite its claims to be enlightened, the world is actually in darkness. And when we hear the term light of the world, we need to ask ourselves, where else did we hear that? Where else did we hear that? Well, Jesus also self-identified himself as the light of the world. In John 8, 12, he said, I am the light of the world. And so Jesus is the true light of the world. And we have the honor of being many lights, if you will. Or perhaps a better way to think about it as we are called to reflect the light who is truly light. See, Jesus gives us this illustration of a, a city that's lit up at night. You cannot hide it. It just, it's there, it stands out, you can see it. And in the same way, no one lights a room by turning on a lamp and then covering it with a basket. As a father, one of, my most, one of the things that riles me up the most is when I come upstairs and my children are downstairs and all the lights are on upstairs and nobody's there. It's not helping anybody, but I'm paying that hydro bill. And so is my wife. She works too. Right? You don't light, turn on the light switch and then leave the room. You don't cover it. In the same way, We are to be points of light all around our community, where we live, where we work. See, often the church is is compared to being a lighthouse. But I think that's, that's not a very good analogy because, first of all, what do you do with a lighthouse? You try to avoid it. (laughs) You try to stay as far away as you can. But secondly, we're a city, right? Points of light everywhere. And this is a far cry from the attention-seeking of the scribes and the Pharisees that Jesus will point out later in here. We're not showing people how great we are or how pure or how holy we are. We're pointing people to the light of the world, to the light who is truly light. I want to leave you with a a thought about good deeds here for a second. There's a a philosophical theory called speak-action theory, I know. It's pretty complicated. I don't really understand all of it, so I'm not expecting everyone here to. But the best I understand it, the very simple thing is, our words are also actions. So if, you're, if we're driving in the car together, and I'm giving directions, and you're driving, and I say, turn left, and you turn left, not only did you perform an action, but I also performed an action by telling you where to go. My, my words made a difference. They changed the trajectory of the car. In the same way as followers of Jesus, there will be times. There will be times where where we will have natural opportunities, God-given opportunities to share the hope that we have of Jesus. And in those moments, my encouragement to you is is not to say, uh, uh, talk to my pastor. It's to be like, look, maybe I don't have all the answers, but I can tell you what Jesus did in my life. I can tell you the difference that he made in me. So let's bring this, this down to earth. You know, when someone says they want to bring things down to earth, they're, they say, let's make it practical. Right? It's all good to, to, to talk in abstracts, but let's take the hypothetical out of it for a second. And I want you to do some, some introspection. Who in, in your life are you called to be salt and light to? What does it practically look like in your home, in your workplace? What what needs preserving? What needs flavoring? Who needs to see Jesus reflected in your life? 
right? How do, how do you, not the person next to you, not the pastor, not the church, we're not solving all the world's problems here. How do you spread out and stand out? Now, maybe you're here and you're saying, you know what? My life has lost its saltiness. Or I'm not sure I'm a really reflection of Jesus if I'm honest. And you know what? I want to commend you for recognizing that. Honesty is the first step. But Jesus has called us to take another step. See, the more pure the salt, the more its flavor. The closer to light, the better the reflection. It all boils down to your relationship with Jesus. It all boils down to your relationship with him. How well do you how, how do you do you take the, the time to, to invest in that relationship, to allow him to change you and to transform you and to make you the kind of person who just naturally stands out, who naturally just goes a different way, who naturally sees the joy and the beauty in life because God is full of joy. And he created the beauty of life. And so if you aren't where you need to be, first of all, none of us are. And second of all, it's not a call to inaction, but to action. To ask Jesus that as you go, he makes you the kind of person who illuminates the world around you. Turning to Jesus and asking him that as you go, as you spread, to make you the kind of person that preserves what is good, draws out the flavor of life, you are bored and fed up with the world's view of what life is, and ultimately to reflect the love of Jesus to everyone, to people that we honor, to people that we despise, and everyone in between. And allow God to, to change us so hopefully we don't despise those people that we despised once. But we can love them as Jesus loved them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to pray a bold and courageous prayer. Don't let us leave this building today the same. I ask that right now that you would just give every person here just some clarity, so some purpose, some calling of, of exactly what it is that you're calling them to do. The kind of person that they're called to be in whatever context they're in. And there's so much variable depending on people's situations, but God, you're bigger than that. You're in, you know us intimately. You love us and you care about us. Help us. Just reflect that to the world around us. Let us be the salt. Let us be the light that you have called us to be. Just, just fill us with, with just that, that steadfastness, that decision today to go and to spread out, to stand out. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand? We're just going to close in this, this final song.
a great Sunday. <laughs>